This is Mill Street Radio from PRX. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Before McDonald's or KFC, there was the Horn and Hardart Automat, a cafeteria-style restaurant where you could buy everything from creamed spinach to meat pie by putting just a few nickels into a slot. A new documentary film called The Automat features interviews with some of Horn and Hardart's biggest fans, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Colin Powell, Carl Reiner, and Mel Brooks. Here's Mel Brooks in the film. Of course, when you say Automat or Horn and Hardart, very few people know what you're talking about. But one of the greatest inventions and insane centers of paradise were these places that had little glass windows framed in brass with knobs. And if you put two nickels into the slot next to the windows, the windows would open up. And you could take out a piece of lemon meringue pie for 10 cents. And you could eat it. And that was called the automat. That was Mel Brooks in The Automat. It's a documentary film by my guest today, Lisa Hurwitz. Lisa, welcome to Milk Street. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. Well, I loved your documentary, The Automat. In fact, I went to the New York one, and uh, it was probably the last few years it was open. But it was just this amazing place. I'll never forget it. But we should probably describe what it is, because unless you're as old as I am, you you don't actually remember being in one. So what was Horn and Hard Art? When you walked in, what did you see? Well, it certainly depended on what decade you were walking in because the heyday of Horn and Hard Art was really the 1920s through the 1950s. And during that time, you would walk into this palace. It was huge. You would go to a counter, a woman would be standing there ready to change your dollar bills into nickels. And she, like Mel says in the film, she would reach behind her without counting a thing and she would just give you 20 nickels for your dollar. So the the magic begins as soon as you, you know, you walk in the places. It's, it's beautiful. It's not like your typical restaurant. And then you go over to these little cubbies. The, the walls are lined with these vending machines and you put your nickel in a slot and you open the little glass window and then you take your plate of food out. And, and there was this magic. You know, I, I love the description of Horn and Hard Art as there was some magic behind the wall. And even the coffee, could you talk about that? Because that's so great, the coffee dispensers for a nickel. So the coffee was, again, (laughs) unlike anything else, of course, at the automat where everything is just so whimsical, the coffee comes out of a silver dolphin spigot. (laughs) And these dolphins were inspired by fountains that to this day you can still see in Italy where the water would come from the dolphin's mouth. Yeah, I, I just, I love that. So Horn and Hard Art started off with sort of lunchrooms. They, they were mostly baked goods, right? That was the, the beginning of Horn and Hard Art? They started off as lunchrooms. And I know it doesn't sound so revolutionary, but it was because before lunchrooms, you had saloons and saloons were not appropriate for women. So these lunchrooms and the Horn and Hard Art lunchroom started opening in 1888 in Philadelphia. They serviced both men and women. And this was important because women were joining the workforce and they needed a place to go eat. And as the film covers, women were stenographers and women were a key element of office work. And office work is was this new thing that was helping, you know, grow major cities like Philadelphia and New York City. And w- when did Horn and Hard Art really become Horn and Hard Art? Was that the 1920s when it really came into its full expression? So Horn and Hard Art was really rapidly growing in New York City as soon as they opened that first automat in 1912 in Times Square. And during the Great Depression, which was a difficult period for most restaurants, the automat was doing some of its best business. So then you get into the 1930s and it's just, these are their golden days. And we should just note for the record, uh, as you do in the documentary, that in 1953, 
they sold 10 million dessert pies <laughs> and 6 million loaves of bread. So th- they were serving a lot of customers. They absolutely were. They were the largest restaurant in America at that time. They were replaced by McDonald's, but this was revolutionary. They were one of the most early American chains, and they were providing consistent food across distances that were prepared in central commissaries. And like today, you know, this is kind of normal stuff, but back then this was the cutting edge. The Automat was often referred to, and Mel Brooks refers to it this way, sort of patriotic. There was a patriotism to Horn and Hardart. Yes. So why was the Automat the essence of being an American? Well, Horn and Hardart represented kind of America at its best. It was plentiful. It was high quality. It was pristine. It was welcoming and inviting. And... It was just the town square in a way. Yeah, and I think what really struck me is that, you know, people in top hats and people who are stenographers and people who have blue-collar construction jobs, for a long time, everybody went to the automat. It, it, it was classless. And I, and I think that is also essentially American, right? It really was truly egalitarian and... It was definitely something that Mr. Horn and Mr. Hardart knew they wanted to do. That was the type of business they wanted to create. One of the reasons that I think this film is working so well right now is that you hear somebody like Mel Brooks and he's sharing these very personal memories that very much, you know, line up with your own and it makes you feel connected We haven't talked about the food, um, which seems an oversight. You asked Mel Brooks about his favorite, and he loved the the, um, ham sandwich with the mustard. Other people talk about the baked beans or the Salisbury steak. Were there items that really sold much better than others? Well, for sure, the film, you know, hits on the biggies. Cream spinach, macaroni and cheese, chicken pot pie, all the pies— the Automat just served such a long menu of items. They, you know, were kind of the opposite of fast food in this sense. You could go to the Automat and, you know, you could have whatever you wanted. So let's talk about the decline. So when did the decline start and why, why did it start, do you think? The decline started in the 60s. The Automats, they were depending on seven-day-a-week traffic and When people left the city to live in the suburbs, they really became five-day-a-week businesses. And then also people's tastes were changing. People were looking for more healthy options. People were also willing to spend more on, you know, fine dining experiences. And the Automat was about thrift and abundance. And these were Depression-era values. They were not values of the Horn and Hardart customers of the 1960s and 70s, per se. Mel Brooks really seemed emotional at times, remembering the automat. I'd say the moment where he got choked up probably was when he asked me for kind of an update. Because he was asking me questions all along the way of our interview. You know, he was also interviewing me because he didn't know what had happened. He ate there. And then, you know, it closed. And so he didn't know how it got from point A to point B. So I walked him through that decline. And, you know, at the end of that story, I told him, you know, he just he just kind of sighs and he looks defeated and kind of brokenhearted. You know, he didn't realize how good it was then, but now he misses it. And I think it's really validating for people to hear somebody that they really look up to, someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Colin Powell, Mel Brooks, say this was a very special, important, beautiful place, and I cherish it. And this film really captures, for certain people, kind of the story of their life. And I know it's just a restaurant, but the film is about much more than a restaurant. Lisa, it's been wistful. 
but it's been inspirational. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That was Lisa Hurwitz, director of the documentary film The Automat. The Automat is screening in select theaters around the country and will soon be available to stream online. You can find more information at automatmovie.com. There was nothing like the coffee at the Automat. You would find a seat, hang up your coat and hat. And for just a shiny nickel, your taste buds you could tickle. With that wonderful, magnificent, unbelievable, awesome coffee at the Automat. That was Mel Brooks performing at the Automat, which he wrote for Hurwitz's film. Right now, it's time to take some calls with my co-host, Sarah Moulton. Sarah is, of course, the star of Sarah's Weeknight Meals on public television, also author of Home Cooking 101. Hey, Sarah, how are you? I'm good, Chris. How about you? I'm good because I just spoke to a guy, James Hoffman from England. He completely changed my mind about how to make coffee. Really? Yeah, and I, I do French press, and the typical deal with French press is you grind it on the coarse side, right, the beans. You put it in the hot water, you stir it up, you let it sit three or four minutes, you put the plunger down, right? I've been doing that for 15 years. He said I was doing it all wrong, and I just, this morning, tested his method. It was much better. So here's his method. It's great. You grind it medium, not coarse, which is very different than what everybody else says. You use 30 grams of ground coffee to 500 grams of water, and I did that. You put it in the French press. You fill it with hot water. He said, don't sweat it, whether it's 205 or 210 or 212, and let it sit for four minutes without stirring. So you get this, you know, crust on crust top. on top. After four minutes, stir it in, and then take a separate spoon and remove any little bits on the top. And let it sit another six or seven minutes. Another six or seven minutes, yeah. And then finally, with the plunger, you put it just so it's under the water. Because if you put it all the way down, it stirs up the sediment. And I got to tell you, it was so good. What kind of bean? I like a medium roast. He says if you see oils on the outside of the bean, it's over roasted, which I agree with. So a medium roast. We tried it this morning. I'm going to have to try it. Anyway, so... I was, that was taking my, notes. My big event. Thanks for sharing. And by the way, check him out on YouTube, James Hoffman. Okay. You know, he's a little obsessive, but that's why he really knows his stuff. My kind of guy. Okay, now it's time to take our first call. Yeah. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? It's Carol from Sudbury, Mass. How can we help you? I was calling about kind of a basic question about fennel. I love fennel. But it seems like, you know, especially in the off season when you buy it at the grocery store, by the time you cut off the stalks at the top and you cut off the base and then you slice it sort of vertically and you have to get the core out. And then they say, don't use the outer pieces because they're sometimes kind of all beat up from the grocery store. There's like nothing left. (laughs) Well, this this is a plot. (laughs) The fennel growers know that you need to buy more than one. How big are the fennel bulbs you're buying? Well, you know, the grocery store doesn't often have a huge selection, but they're about a pound each. Well, here's what I would do. Cut off the stalk, which, by the way, you can use. It has a sort of anise flavor. Your friend of mine, Mark Bittman, uses it when he grills fish. He puts it on fennel. I would slice off a fairly thin amount of the bottom. Don't take a huge half-inch chunk out of it. And then okay. uh, if you take the entire outer layer off, You've now lost 20% of your fennel bulb. So depending on the condition of it, I would sometimes slice off any brown spots or parts and leave the outer layer if it's in reasonably good shape. And that way you are only cutting off a relatively small part. You're not taking a huge chunk out of it. And then I would slice across. But when you buy it, find ones where the outer layer doesn't have big brown spots. I also use it in salad. It's my secret salad ingredient. Raw fennel is just terrific. Yeah, I love it, too. I'm going to try to grow it because I'm so fed up with, you know, losing half of it. Some things end up in your supermarket in pretty good shape, but fennel does look like someone played hockey with it by the time it ends up. That's a good point. I don't know. Maybe that stuff's been sitting on trucks for three weeks or something. Sarah, do you have a... Yeah, well, no, basically I agree with what Chris said, although you really can eat all of it 
you could use them the way he suggested Mark Bittman did, but you could also just slice them really thin and they'd still be perfectly edible. And the fronds are wonderful. You use them like you would like dill or something. It's like dill, yeah. But the other thing is we used to braise them at this restaurant Mm. I worked at. We'd cut them into thick slices and then braise them, leave them attached at the root end. But we would use a vegetable peeler to take a little bit of that outer layer off. The other thing I would recommend, I've been thinking about, (laughs) it's one of the things that keeps me up at night, is, so you've noticed that fennel has a grain, sort of like celery does. And so I've done an Mm -hmm. experiment. If you want to avoid sort of the stringiness, cut it across the grain. If you're going to use it in a salad and eat it raw, which makes it more tender. You know, if you're going to cook it, it really doesn't matter because it'll get tender anyway. That's a great idea. I cut across... The width of it. Yeah, which is you're cutting across the grain. But some people don't do that. So I think it's an important thing to point out. The best way to preserve some of it is use a peeler or a paring knife if you're better with a paring knife. I use a serrated peeler because it's slippery and hard. Yeah. The braising, by the way, is a great idea. It's like on dive, like braising on dive. It is so good. We used to um, do these slices with whole cloves of garlic, and then we'd add veal stock to it. And then we would puree the garlic with the veal stock, and it would thicken it. And it was just Mm. essence of yummy, tender fennel and with a hint of creamy garlic. It was so good. I think we're a fennel fan club here, I'd say. The three of us. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> well, Carol, now we both have dreams of braised fennel. <laughs> Dancing, Dancing in, in our heads, heads. yes. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Oh, well, thank yeah. you so much. Thank I you. really appreciate it. It's like speaking to cooking royalty, oh, you guys. Thank you. Well, it depends which royalty <laughs> okay. these days. Yeah, really, you, you have be to careful. be careful. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, in a good way. Okay. Thank right. you, Carol. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? This is George from Napa, California. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. I hope you guys are too. This is a real honor. I'm a big fan of both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. How can we help you uh, from a culinary point of view? (laughs) Yes. I've tried twice to make the pasta alla grigia. Right. And my pecorino clumps into this mess. Congealed mess, yes. Um, maybe it's happened to you. I don't know, but you described it perfectly. And I've tried twice, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I sourced the guanciale. I have the real pecorino romano and uh, tried to do everything right with the ingredients. You called it exactly the right time because we just spent three weeks making cacio e pepe 36 times, which is essentially the same recipe, more or less. And um, we found, of course... You know, pecorino and parmesan both are aged. They're relatively dry cheeses. And you have to do two things. When you cook your pasta, cook it in two quarts, not four quarts. And that means your water is going to be starchier, which is going to help bind the sauce properly. And number two, you need that water to be hot, like 185 degrees, which is the point at which the pecorino is going to melt. And if you don't get it hot enough, it's not going to melt properly. And so that's the second trick. The third is there's a guy on YouTube who has this famous cacio e pepe recipe. He's a chef, and he does it in a blender. He puts the pecorino and parmesan in whatever it was for cacio e pepe, and then a fair amount of like a cup and a half or so of very hot pasta liquid and puts it in a blender and emulsifies it and then finishes it up with some olive oil and other things. But the point is you could try a blender with a cup or a cup and a half of that water very hot, with the cheese, and blend it. And then put that in a skillet with a slightly undercooked pasta with more cooking water, another half cup or cup, and cook it for a couple of minutes. And that should do it. Are you guys going to update your cacio pepe? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. We've completely revised it. It's all done in one skillet now at one time. But the trick is the temperature of the water because that cheese really needs to get properly melted. I'm staying in Thank my corner you. over here because I'm. <laughs> oh. I, I know nothing, uh, but I. This is intriguing. I like this idea of the blender too. We'll publish our method soon, and uh, we'll send you a copy of the recipe too. So I'll be on the lookout. All I right. can't thank you enough. And next time, Sarah, I'm going to have some problem that I can get your input. Oh, on you're too. very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. All right, George. Thank it. you. Take care. Thanks for calling. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. This is Mill Street Radio. 
Sarah and I are ready to take your calls. Give us a ring, 855-426-9843. That's 855-426-9843. Or email us at questions at MilkStreetRadio.com. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hi, this is Bronwyn from Tampa. How can we help you? Well, today I'm calling about pavlova. To preface this, I should say that I'm really not much of a baker. But last Father's Day, I made a Nigella Lawson's New York Times strawberry pavlova, and it turned out really well. Good. And it was super easy. And it was so good, in fact, that my daughter and I polished the whole thing off and left my husband a very small slice. So (laughs) now I'm wanting to make another one, but for significantly more people. Is it as easy as quadrupling all the ingredients? If I do that, there's going to be 16 eggs and five cups of sugar. You have a standing mixer of some kind, I assume? Yeah, I have a a KitchenAid regular Mm -hmm. mixer. I could do it in two batches because what I was also thinking, I'd like to make them into individual, maybe like eight pavlovas or nine, and bake them. And that's where I just don't know what to do with the oven temperature and how long because you bake it at 300 for an hour and 15 minutes and then just let the oven cool. But I think if they're smaller, you probably don't bake them for that long. Well, a few things. 16 egg whites sounds like things are getting out of control because it's going to be hard to whip them evenly and you're going to end up with egg whites above your whisk in the KitchenAid. I think doing in two batches makes sense. And in baking, usually when you quadruple something, it's almost always a train wreck for whatever reason, so I would double it. I don't think you have to worry about the proportions of ingredients. I think with meringue, that's probably okay. The one thing you would worry about is the thickness. The thickness will affect the cooking time. You said 300 degrees, which sounds a little high for meringue. So it was an hour and 15 minutes, and then you just shut it off and let it sit for another hour or two or something? Yeah, she preheats the oven to 350. You pop the pavlova right in there, turn the heat immediately down to 300, and it said bake for an hour and 15 minutes, turn off the heat, and let it cool completely in the oven. And it turned out perfectly as far as I was concerned. So, but obviously if they're smaller. Again, check the thickness, but I would probably preheat the oven to 300, put them in, shove it down to 250. I assume these are smaller if you're doing individual yeah. ones. Let it probably cook for a couple hours and then turn the oven off, something like that. That would be a typical meringue recipe. You know, look, if her recipe worked and if the thickness ends up being the same, you're probably in pretty good shape. So. Right. It seems like the proportion of sugar to yeah. whites was probably correct. When they were done, did they have any color on them or were they still white or were they slightly golden? They were slightly golden, which I liked. Okay. Well, then that's a reason to keep yeah. the temperature the way she did it. Uh, yeah, although, but if her diameter is smaller, they are probably going to cook faster. Don't you think the thickness is more important than anything else? I think that's important. Like the height, you mean? Yeah, the height. But if she had a nine-inch cake pan, and these are now going to be four or five-inch individual ones, yeah. they're going to cook faster. Yeah. I mean, listen, it worked the first time. So mm-hmm. I would double it. I wouldn't go any further than doubling because the egg whites won't get properly beaten. And I would do what Chris said and um, see how it so goes. heat it to 300, 300. down to 250. Right, and, and, and give and it like two hours. an hour and a half. Yeah, and then just I think turn it, it an hour and a half you can quick check it to yeah. see if it's firmed up. Yeah. Quick, just in and out. And then if it seems like it's firmed up, turn off the oven, leave it in. And if it hasn't, give it another half an hour and then turn off the oven and yeah. leave it in. Sounds great. You, you need to get back to us and let us know, though. Yeah, this please is one of those do. That, this is interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I absolutely will. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks for calling. <laughs> okay. Bye. It's great talk. Bye, bro. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Up next, Amico Davies transports us to Venice for a taste of Cicchetti. That's coming up in just a moment. This is Milk Street Radio. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Right now, it's my interview with Amico Davies, author of Cinnamon and Salt, Cicchetti in Venice. Amico, welcome to Milk Street. Hi, thank you for having me. So, you know, I've been to Venice uh, more than a few times, and it's always, of course, magical. But let's go way back in history, like to the 13th century, sort of Marco Polo's time. 
it was really the center of culture in the Mediterranean. So why was Venice a big deal? Is it because of its location or, or what? Venice had um, a really strong maritime history. And in the Middle Ages, they were not just um, explorers, but they were importers. So they were they re- had really become like the pantry of Europe. They had like exclusive trading rights with Constantinople, for example. So they were the only Western country at the time that would be able to have that gateway to the East. And so they had built up this little empire also through gaining colonies. They had, you know, colonies around the Dalmatian coast. They had Crete. They had Mm. Cyprus. They had, um, you know, all the way to the Middle East. When you look at a map of, you know, historical Venice, it was like the whole Mediterranean. The other thing you you, you write about in Cinnamon and Salt is that the, the cultural mix was really interesting. You say... Bakeries were run by Albanians, while the butchers were Croatian. Armenians taught Phoenicians how to cook rice. So uh, the mix of cultures and cuisines was fairly extraordinary, right? Yeah, this is one of the things I think makes Venice so incredibly unique in the Italian peninsula, because Venice was this city that had, you know, this constant flux of people from all parts of the world, the known, you know, world in Europe at the time coming through it. You know, in a lot of Venetian dishes, you'll find the base of the dish is like a slowly cooked onion. There's lots and lots of onions in Venetian cooking. And that is a technique that many food historians think comes from Turkey. Also some vegetables like artichokes, eggplants, pumpkins, those kind of vegetables come from Jewish cuisine in Venice and rice from the Armenians. Venice was like a collector of ingredients and spices and dishes, and these things all sort of left their mark in Venice. And if you look closely enough, you you can see them still. So let's get to the, the topic at hand, which are the, the small plate tradition, chichetti, which is a very – it's a little bit like meze, I guess, but but not quite. So could you explain what this tradition is, where do they come from, and, and how it's different than, let's say, being in Spain with tapas? Yeah, people often liken chiquetti to tapas, and, um, and the Venetians are very sensitive about that. You'll see some bars that have a sign on the front saying, this is not tapas. <laughs> um, I think that the idea of, you know, a small bite is something that you'll find – in cuisines, obviously, all over the world, they're like hors d'oeuvres or they're like aperitivo that you'll have in other Italian cities. But what makes Cicchetti very Venetian is the tradition of the actual bar itself, which is called a baccaro. And in these places, these little wine bars, you'll find counters full of all these different offerings. Cicchetti actually comes from the Latin word chicus, which means small thing. So you can kind of trace back this tradition of standing in a bar with a little bite to eat and a little glass of wine to more or less the Renaissance, where Venice had these osteria, which today an osteria is something that you would think of as a restaurant. But in the Renaissance, this was more like an inn or a pub where you had um, you know, food and drink on the, on the ground floor. And on the floors above, you would have rooms for foreigners and people passing through, travellers, merchants. And because the government was also a little bit suspicious <laughs> and in general there was a lot of um, sort of surveillance of the population happening in, in Venice around that time, they took away all the tables and chairs. They didn't want you to sit down because they were worried that if you were sitting over a meal, then you would have you know a lot more opportunity to conspire against what? the government. <laughs> That's crazy. So, <laughs> so no sitting and eating. <laughs> really? Is that really true? Is that they thought that they would end up with a political uprising because people were sitting and talking? Yeah, yeah. So this was a law <laughs> throughout Venice. So you had to stand and eat. Huh. And once you take away the table, um, you know, the shape of the food and the way you can eat it hmm. is is different. You have to have, you know, finger food. It has right. to be on a stick maybe. And that's still how you see chicchetti today. There are these little fried things or maybe it's like a half-boiled egg with a little toothpick through it. And they are bites that you can eat, you know, without necessarily a plate <laughs> without knives and forks and you know you can eat them standing and that's still how chiquetti are usually 
eaten in Venice. Well, you, you had a list of, of sort of simple ones, which I loved. And, and I let's just go through a few because th- they are really two different things that go together in an interesting way, right? So gorgonzola with an anchovy or a slice of mortadella with a pickled pepper or prosciutto with olive pate, or, you know. So they're two things that really pair in an interesting way. I realize they have more sophisticated stuff too, but – I really like that as a as a fundamental concept for a cicchetti. Yeah, actually, the cicchetti are um, are really very simple. I mean, sometimes it's just literally a half boiled egg with nothing even on it, mm. or or it could be even a boiled potato. And I love that because those are very simple things that you know make you feel satisfied, are so comforting and filling. And the other thing is that some of the traditional cicchetti that you see today, you know, really come from like a time when it was really important for whoever was the host of the wine bar to be, you know, making sure people were buying glasses of wine. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure you've got things that make people thirsty. (laughs) So anchovies, um, gorgonzola, those kind of salty foods, you know, would would make you reach for another glass of wine, but also things like a hard boiled egg. If you're eating one of those you know, without anything to wash it down, you're going to find it hard to swallow it. Well, as you said in the book, salty, spicy, or hard to swallow. And then I love this quote, <laughs> yeah. a crostino with gorgonzola guarantees at least three drinks. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a method to the madness. So take us through. So you walk into a wine bar. You say it's not like tapas. It's different. What does it look like? When do people go? You mentioned they're open in the morning. Uh, yeah. How does it work? So a Cicchetti bar, like any time goes, they open from early in the morning. Usually if you go to the ones around the market, which are where the very traditional Cicchetti bars are, those are open at like 8.30 in the morning. And partly this is to service also the people who are actually at, you know, the market sellers. So the fishermen who've been up since, you know, who knows what time and market sellers as well. You know, chikiati are appropriate at any time of the day. So that's another thing that makes it different, I think, from tapas or or other aperitivo in, in Italy where it's more an evening thing. And when you go in, there are often small places. Some places have like a kitchen as well, but many of them, they do all their preparation at a countertop and you'll have behind the glass, you know, this array of different chikiati from artichoke bottoms to crostini with all kinds of toppings. Sometimes the crostini is a grilled piece of polenta, but usually it's a slice of baguette where you'll have toppings from bacala mantecato, which is a whipped right. cod. That's a really, really, really classic Venetian chiquetto. Uh, there might be some sarde and saor, which are sardines that are dressed in like a vinegary onion sort of mixture. And There'll often be some fried things, so polpette, which are deep fried right. meatballs. Uh, you might find mozzarella in carrozza, which is a fried cheese sandwich, essentially. There might even be like fried calamari or roast potatoes on a stick. That's another one that you might see. And then there's usually an array of fresh seafood as well. So are these are on small plates on the bar and you just pick what you want? How's the food presented? Yeah, they're usually grouped together, all the different types. And you can see them through the glass counter. So, you know, even if you don't speak Italian, you just point you know, at each one that you want and they'll put them on a plate for you and, um, and away you go. Could you talk about Tardivo? I, I didn't know about this. It's a form of radicchio and how it's <laughs> how it's finished off. It's an it's an amazing story and one I, d- I did not know. Yeah, right. The radicchio is one of my absolutely favorite vegetables and the Veneto is famous for it. You get really spoilt with the options of radicchio um, in, in Venice because you can find not just the, the round one, which is called chioggia, um, but you can find the tardivo, which is like an elongated shape and um, has like long, curly, beautiful leaves that that are sort of as thick as a finger. Um, And those are all grown in in the Veneto region only. Well, you you wrote that it's grown outside, and then the first frost, the leaves are burned. And then in late November, I didn't know, they 
bring them inside with the roots, put them in large pools of running water in complete darkness for up to three weeks. And then the plant yeah. begins to grow again. And then you have different color leaves. I mean, it's just an amazing process. Yeah, it's a it's a labor of love, really. It's like an art form. So what's going on in Venice these days? Uh, Venice has had a share of problems, obviously. Is, is it a very vibrant culture? Is it a bunch of older, wealthier people? Does it have a sort of a new generation coming up? Are these Cicchetti bars part of that? What's the context here? Um, so Venice has quite a few different issues going on. Um, I think it's a city that people are sort of looking at at the moment as a sort of like what's going to happen to Venice, um, partly because of the rising waters and climate change, um, a lot because of the effects of over-tourism. Right. And visiting Venice, you know, right after lockdown in, in 2020, which is when I first went to research this book, what was really interesting was that, uh, you know, so much of Venice is – made for tourists, um, especially around, you know, sites like Piazza San Marco, which, by the way, was completely empty. Um, You know, most things absolutely just closed for for months um, in 2020. Uh, And then the other thing that Venice has, though, is is these great pockets, these beautiful neighbourhoods where there is a really strong community and where there is life and it's very very vibrant so I I was staying near Piazza San Marco and I would walk from these like it felt like a ghost town and head up to Canareggio which is a great little neighborhood in the northern part of Venice and you could barely walk down the fondamenta from how Mm. packed it was with people sitting at wine bars drinking talking a lot of them are younger people Venice has you know a large university population as well and Venice has these pockets and plenty of them where even during a high season, the touristy season, you might be like on a street with like a crush of tourists. But then, you know, you get lost or you you, you turn off of the beaten path and a couple of streets away, you'll find, you know, a campo, a piazza where it's just the locals and there's kids kicking a ball and uh, old ladies sitting on a park bench. And um, I, I really, I really love that about Venice. It's almost like like two places in one. Emiko, thank you very much. Uh, And the next time I go to Venice, I will be rushing off to the Cicchetti Bars. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was Emiko Davies. Her book is entitled Cinnamon and Salt, Cicchetti in Venice. In addition to Cicchetti, there are many things that the casual tourist does not know about Venice. It was once an independent empire that lasted a thousand years and reached all the way to the Balkans, including Croatia. Venetian masks are tourist items these days, but during the Middle Ages, they were both a means of hiding your identity when doing something a bit sketchy, as well as a practical form of PPE for doctors treating patients during the plague. On a sadder note, there are only 60,000 local residents today, and many predict that there may be none left in just another generation. So if Venice does not succumb to rising waters, tourism will finally destroy a wealthy empire that lasted a thousand years. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Coming up, Dan Pashman tells us why the world deserves a better vegetable sandwich. That's right after the break. I'm Christopher Kimball. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Right now, it's time to chat with J.M. Hirsch about this week's recipe, Greek meatballs with tomato sauce. J.M., how are you? I'm great. So I was going to go to Crete, uh, (laughs) but you took my place at the last minute. I did. I did. Uh, Thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. But you had some great food, and you came across Greek meatballs with tomato sauce, sort of a meze dish, I guess which I did not think was going to be one of the stars of the trip, turned out to be exactly that. So what are they and where did you have them? 
Yeah, you know, it was an unexpected find. I did not actually go looking for food. I went looking for wine, frankly. I, I met a lovely couple, Alexander Manusakis and her husband, Afshin Malavi, and they run a, a family-owned winery. You know, it's a very small operation, and they do terrific wines, actually some of the best wines I had on the island. They just invited me over for lunch, and they just started rolling out all this amazing food. And I got to say, you know as well as I do from your travels that the magic is in the moment. You know, the food, of course, has to be good, and it was. But it's in the magic of meeting people, becoming friends, drinking wine, sharing food, sharing stories. And that's exactly what this afternoon was. It was really just a wonderful time. You know, we started off with this Cretan salad uh, that's kind of their version of almost an Italian panzanella, like a bread salad. And then we moved on to these giganti beans cooked in a tomato sauce. It was phenomenal. And then we moved on from there to a beef stew with tomato and orzo. It was lovely. But, as you say, the star wore these meatballs. They're kind of oblong-shaped meatballs called sutsukakia. What I loved about them is they had a lovely, like, kind of browned crust on the outside because they are browned in a skillet before they're simmered in a tomato sauce. But they were so wonderfully spiced. And, you know, they had garlic and mint, oregano, cumin, paprika, grated onion, and they just came together so nicely. And then they were cooked in this really bright, kind of naturally sweet tomato sauce that they had done very little to. And and that's what I loved about it. You know, they let the tomatoes kind of speak for themselves and act as an accent to these well-spiced meatballs. It was just a wonderful combination. Well, as you travel around the world, you can eat chicken soup. (laughs) <laughs> almost everywhere, <laughs> and some form of meatballs. <laughs> and the way they spice and prepare them tell you so much about where you are in the world. Right, exactly. It's so interesting that there are these common recipes, but they're actually very different. Right. Well, everybody kind of puts their own inflection on it. And in this case, you know, it's a the tradition is a combination of both beef and lamb. And the combination of, you know, that kind of Lamb has more of a presence and, it, you know, a richness to it. And it really worked so well with the oregano and the cumin and the paprika. And it was very different. Like, you know, we're used to kind of the red sauce, American, Italian meatballs. And this was such a very different presence on the plate. It was really nice. A simple recipe, but probably one of the best you had on Crete. Uh, Greek meatballs with tomato sauce. Good as a meze, good as a main course. Thank you, Jam. Thank you. You can find this recipe for Greek meatballs with tomato sauce at 177milkstreet.com. This is Milk Street Radio. Now it's time for some culinary wisdom from one of our listeners. Hi, Milk Street. My name is Stacy. My tip is for anyone who makes lots of drop cookies. I'm on the shorter side, and I have a tall stainless steel mixer bowl. Repeatedly going from the bowl to the cookie sheet with my scoop feels very awkward. I have my elbow sticking up in the air and it's just weird. So to make it more efficient, I wad up my kitchen towel and I make a ramp with it for the bowl. I tilt my bowl on the towel ramp and now going in and out of the bowl is much easier because the mouth of the bowl faces me and not the ceiling. And this might be helpful if you're making cookies with children too. Cheers! If you'd like to share your own cooking tip here on Milk Street Radio, please go to 177milkstreet.com slash radio tips. Next up, it's Dan Pashman. Hey, Dan, what's up? Well, Chris, I'm thinking right now about sandwiches, and I'm a little bit perturbed. Are we doing the definition of a sandwich now or something? No, 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 no. We no. moved on. I, I, I love sandwiches. I'm not a vegetarian, but I do sometimes like veggie sandwiches without meat in them. Especially like if I'm like, I don't know, at an airport or some random place where I just need some food and I'm like, I don't really want the turkey sandwich that's been sitting out in this terminal for God knows how long. (laughs) And I want a veggie sandwich and I'm very upset because I feel like at least in many places in America, there are only two kinds of vegetarian sandwiches that anyone seems like anyone's ever heard of. You know what they are, right? There's the one that's like grilled eggplant, red pepper and onion with mozzarella and maybe like balsamic vinegar. Or it's like hummus, feta, olives, red onion. Right. Now those are both fine sandwiches, but like there's so many other options and I'm just tired of those two and I want more like run of the mill sandwich shops to put a little more effort into having better vegetarian sandwiches. Now, why do you think this is? Because uh, vegetables and vegetarian and vegan cooking 
have become so popular in the last five years, it just hasn't. It's like trickle down economics and never trickle down to the sandwich department. Yeah, or I, I think it's probably mostly laziness. It's it's like you know these these places say, well, there's more vegetarians now, more demand for vegetarian food, so we need a vegetarian option. Well, there's that one or the other one. That's what everyone does. So just throw one of those on the menu, and it's like. There's this mentality that, like, by simply having a vegetarian option, no matter how lame and uninspired it is, you've checked that box. And you're, yet, from a business perspective and a culinary perspective, I think that those places are missing an opportunity to be known for great vegetarian sandwiches. Okay, so uh, Milk Street's now hiring you to okay. be the vegetarian sandwich consultant. Oh, I, what this is the do? role I was born to play. All right, first thing, <laughs> one thing that should be in more sandwiches, broccoli. Oh, All right. I, I didn't believe it till I saw it at the number seven sub shop in New York City that it would even work. I, I thought, how do they even keep it in the sandwich? But if you get a nice big sub roll, not sliced bread, but a sub roll, yeah. it will stay in there. It'll stay in there because you don't eat you know, it. <laughs> no, I love <laughs> That's I why. love broccoli. I think it's one of the best vegetables. I love broccoli. I eat it like three times a week, but okay, what else do you put with it? At the number seven sub shop, they do it with pickled lychee and like ricotta salada. It's very huh. nice. I okay. did my own version at home recently. I had some leftover charred broccoli from the night before with a nice, yeah. you know, nice crisp charred edges. And I happen to have a leftover half a loaf of a semolina bread from an Italian bakery. Yeah. I have this sheep and goat milk cheese spread in a jar. And then I also had some feta cheese. And then I really got a little fancy, which is not like me, especially no. at lunch during the week. I toasted some pine nuts. And let me tell you something, Chris. This sandwich is crunchy. It's salty, it's creamy, it's tangy. It has every flavor and texture you could ever want in a sandwich, and it's 100% vegetarian. Here's Dan Pashman, who argues about whether hot dogs is a sandwich. Right. And, and now he's toasting <laughs> pine nuts for his lunch with his semolina bread. Dan, yeah. what's, what's going on? Look, the mood comes over me from time to time. I'm not a person who puts a ton of effort into most of my meals. I mean, I, mean, I, I care a lot, but I also am always, you know, like— Ideally, trying to find maximum deliciousness without spending hours and hours on it. Right. Can I tell you another another broccoli one that I do sometimes? Yeah. So I'll take a flour tortilla, a little shredded mozzarella, throw yeah. it in the microwave uh, so the tortilla is soft and doughy and chewy and the cheese melts. And then again, leftover roast broccoli and spicy chili crisp. Uh, now that, okay, now you got me. I okay. love, you know, chili crisp is having its day. That's right. So, okay, right. so our, one last question. Do you have a non-broccoli vegetarian sandwich? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you should have titled love... this segment, How to Eat Broccoli Between Bread. Well, yeah, but let's make broccoli the star of the vegetarian sandwiches. Enough of these mediocre grilled vegetables. You put grilled red pepper in a sandwich, you taste nothing but red pepper. Right. And and the hummus and feta, you know, one like yeah, it's fine. I like hummus, but like that's not a that's not a lunch, that's a snack. Okay, you you <laughs> fill this sandwich with broccoli and some kind of cheese on a big hearty sub roll. Like that's something that I can stick my teeth into and I can get behind. Next time I'm in an airport, I want a broccoli sandwich. I think you're right, but you've forgotten the the key ingredient. What prosciutto? Oh, that would be very good. <laughs> Dan Pashman, uh, if you're going to have a vegetarian sandwich, consider the broccoli. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was Dan Pashman, host of the Sporkful Food Podcast. That's it for today. You know, we've produced over 200 episodes of Milk Street Radio over the years. You can find them all on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, MilkStreetRadio.com, or wherever you find your podcasts. To explore more about Milk Street, please go to 177MilkStreet.com. There you can download our recipes, watch our TV show, learn about our magazine, and our latest cookbook, The World in a Skillet. You can also find us on Facebook at Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, on Instagram and Twitter at 177 Milk Street. We'll be back next week with more food stories and kitchen questions. Thanks, as always, for listening. Kimball's Milk Street Radio is produced by Milk Street in association with GBH. Co-founder, Melissa Baldino. Executive producer, Annie Sinsabaugh. Senior editor, Melissa Allison. Producer, Sarah Clapp. Assistant producer, Caroline Davis, with production help from Debbie Paddock. Additional editing by Sydney Lewis. Audio mixing by Jay Allison at Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. 
Theme music by Chewbop Crew. Additional music by George Brindle Egloff. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is distributed by PRX. PRX.